Greetings um, and welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, let me start by thanking uh, um, Michael and Christy and Jenny and the rest of the uh, the Michigan team for making this possible and, and, and having us here on stage. I'm going to introduce everybody really quickly uh, and then sit back down for a bit. Uh, um, Mark Newman, was, so, so we didn't have uh, a cultural anthropologist, um, uh, but we do have a physicist. Uh, um, so uh, Mark Newman uh, is, is going to take us out of the same thing, I, I suppose. Um, uh, um, uh, he's going to take us out of our comfort zone um, and, and give us uh, the big picture view of System Think. Uh, um, I'll, I'll point out that uh, when there was a group of us at the OFR that uh, um, decided to form a reading group around uh, uh, networks, network analysis, um, and the first place we started was by uh, each buying a copy of uh, Mark's textbook, uh, which, which I can strongly recommend. My publisher thanks you. <laughs> and his publisher thanks me. Um, uh, uh, then I'll talk, uh, and then Adair Morse, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, well, you'll see what I talk about. Uh, Adair Morse is going to uh, uh, talk about uh, applications of fintech to financial inclusion, and then uh, Jared Sawyer at the end uh, um, will uh, talk about the regulatory uh, response and what's going on in Treasury. So without further ado, I will sit down and give Mark a chance to speak. Thank you. Well, I hope this won't be too uncomfortable. Uh, uh, so I am a physicist, so I don't work on financial risk. But what I do work on is uh, networks of uh, connections between people and organizations and what the structure of those networks can tell us about many things that we're interested in, uh, but including uh, certain types of risk that I'll talk about. So uh, here's an example picture of the kind of thing that I work on. This is uh, an example from my own work. This is a network of collaborations in this case. It's uh, collaborations, in fact, between a group of scientists. So the nodes in this picture represent a group of scientists. And the connections between them, the lines, represent who's been collaborating with whom. And the idea is that we're interested in the way the structure of a network like this could affect things like, for instance, the spread of information. So if you're uh, a person on one side of this network and you want to communicate with a person on the other side of ne this network, it's going to take a long time for information to diffuse from one side to the other. Um, let me give you a few other examples. This is uh, a picture of a friendship network. So this is a group of uh, students in a US high school. Uh, and uh, the nodes represent the students in the school. The connections between them represent who's friends with whom. You take a look at a picture like this, you can clearly see that there's some interesting structure going on. There are these four groups of nodes in the network. So, you know, what's going on with that? Uh, this uh, is a network uh, that comes from a study by my friend Valdis Krebs. Um, and it shows uh, patterns of close physical proximity between people, so the nodes are again people, the lines represent who's been uh, in close contact with whom, and this is of interest because uh, we're interested in the spread of diseases of various kinds. So this, I will talk about this more in a moment, this is one kind of risk that we can use to understand how networks affect risk. Um, so if you're concerned about the spread of a disease, like for instance, the flu, then, uh, the flu spreads, you know, if I have the flu, I can give it to you if we come sufficiently close to one another, if we're in, in physical proximity with one another. So there is some network of who's been in proximity with whom, and the disease spreads over that network. So if you want to understand how the disease spreads, and in particular, if you want to understand what is your risk for catching this disease, then you need to know what the structure of this network is. I'll give you one more example. This is kind of a fun one. Uh, this, again, represents a group of high school students in a, a U.S. high school. The nodes here are the students. They are color-coded blue and pink, the traditional baby gift color code to represent the boys and the girls. And there is a connection between any two nodes if they dated during their high school career. So... Right, so, well, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, so this is a fun 
network. I think many of us would like to have seen a network like this for our high school. Uh, actually, many of us wanted to be that kid there, right? <laughs> I mean, you can see that one right there. Um, uh, so, so, so this is this is fun, but it also has a serious side to it. So this comes from a large multi-year study funded by the NIH. It's a multi-million dollar project involved interviewing tens of thousands of kids in schools all across the country. And why did they put all this effort into studying this? They they put it in this effort because they're concerned about the risk of uh, HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. And if that's the risk that you're concerned about, then this is the network that you need to be looking at. OK, so that's an example of some of the kinds of things we study. Um, so, uh, so I want to uh, think about uh, risk in these networks. Uh, and. The first example I want to give is of the spread of disease. It's one that's been very well studied. There is a, a long history going back uh, about a century to the early part of the 20th century of uh, people uh, mathematically studying uh, epidemiology, the way diseases spread, and more recently making computer models. Um, so it's a very well-developed field, one of the few fields in which I feel like we really have a very strong theoretical understanding of the nature of risk. Um, and so it's a good starting place for making analogies with how we might be concerned about network effects on other kinds of risk. So suppose I'm this red dot in the middle of this figure here, and I'm concerned about my risk for catching the flu, for example. So. Certainly, that depends on who I have contact with. So in this particular case, I have direct contact with three people. That's the sort of first ring around me in this figure. So it's clearly the case that if I have contact with a lot of people, then I'm at greater risk for catching the flu than if I have contact with only a few people. If I'm a hermit that lives in the mountains and never talks to anybody, then there's zero chance that I will catch the flu. Um, however, it's not just uh, how many people I have contact with that matters. It's also who I have contact with, because it depends on what their level of risk is. If I have contact with people who are themselves high-risk individuals, then that makes me a high-risk individual as well. Um, conversely, if uh, I have uh, contact with uh, only with people who are at low risk, if the people I have contact with are very unlikely to have the flu, then, uh, then there's very little chance that I'll get it. I can't catch the flu. If the people I have contact with themselves don't have. It doesn't matter how many people I have contact with. If they don't themselves have the flu, then I can't catch it either. So it matters not only how many people I know, but also what their level of risk is. And their level of risk depends, in turn, on the people they have contact with. That would be the second circle out for me in this figure. And their level of risk depends on the people they have contact with, and so on ad infinitum. So it really is a network effect. It doesn't just depend on who I know or my local environment within the network. It goes on ad infinitum, and it, hence it depends on the structure of the entire network. In order to understand my level of risk, I need to understand the structure of the entire network. So it really is a systemic effect. Even though I'm only concerned about a local thing, me personally, it's a systemic effect of the entire structure of the network. So as I say, this is now a well-developed field. Um, there's been some very sophisticated work in this field. Here's one example uh, from a study by Steve Eubank and his collaborators at Virginia Tech, in which they constructed the entire network of connections between people in the city of Portland, Oregon. So they made a detailed micro simulation of the entire city, including every street, every car, every person, every building and used it to work out who comes in contact with whom, and then to predict how diseases would spread through the city. Here's another example from the work of Vittoria Kalitsa and collaborators. Uh, this shows uh, simulation results from uh, a model of a hypothetical outbreak of the flu that starts in Asia and spreads worldwide. And here they're calculating levels of risk in individual uh, cities within Europe. So an example of a classic result in this field is the following. Uh, the risk 
to an individual with catching disease clearly depends on how likely the disease is to spread. There's a fundamental parameter in these models, which is uh, so-called transmissibility or transmission probability, which is the probability that a person who has, who is infected, spreads the infection to uh, their uninfected neighbor in the network. So when the transmission probability is very low, the disease doesn't spread very far, and when it's high, it spreads very easily, as you would expect. But it's more interesting than that. What you see is so-called phase transition behavior. For low values of the transmissibility, nothing happens at all. The disease simply doesn't spread. Uh, it might spread to one or two people, but it's just going to fizzle out, and it just dies out, and then there's no disease, and it doesn't get anywhere else. Um, but if you have high values of transmissibility, then it spreads and you have a big epidemic outbreak. And the transition between those two happens. It's a sharp transition. It happens at a specific point. Below that point, just nothing. And above that point, you have worldwide spread of this disease. So there's a sharp transition where you just step one foot over the line and suddenly you have disaster. Your disease is spreading worldwide and you have sort of systemic failure in your system. So this is a sort of classic result in the field, been well known for a long time. Uh, it's maybe suggestive for other kinds of risks that you might be interested in. However, to be fair, I don't think that this simple model of biological infection is a good model for uh, other kinds of transmission, like sort of social infections of various kinds um, that might be sort of more applicable to the kinds of issues we're talking about on this panel. Um, when uh, people talk about social infections. I'm thinking of things like panic infecting a community. They often use a different model called a complex contagion model. Uh, so in standard biological contagion, you catch a disease from one other person. Whoever infects you, that's the person who gave you the disease. In complex contagion, uh, you can catch a disease from more than one other person. So an example of this would be, suppose you hear a rumor that something happened. Some, one of your friends tells you something, and you're like, okay, that's weird. That doesn't sound like something real. I'm not going to believe this rumor. Um, it just sounds very implausible to you. You ignore it. But then later on, another of your friends completely independently tells you the same thing. Hey, did you hear that this happened? And you're like, well, that's weird. Okay, maybe this is real, and now you believe it. So it's a different kind of infection in which you have to get infected by two people before you yourself get infected. Uh, so this is commonly used as a model of the spread of rumors or information or panic in social systems, and it has an interesting feature. So it still has that sudden transition from no spread to spread, but now the transition becomes much sharper. You go from nobody infected, sudden jump, lots of people infected. In fact, in certain parameter regimes of this model, the jump is what we call discontinuous jump, meaning that you go from nobody infected down here to suddenly almost everyone infected discontinuously. It's just a sudden jump. Um, and this is a particularly insidious form of a risk because there's no signal that it's going to happen before you step over the line. Everything looks completely normal, and then you just step that, take that one last step across the line, and suddenly a huge fraction of people in the system are infected. Um, so you could ask, what can we do to prevent this kind of systemic failure? Um, so this will be my last slide. Um, there are standard techniques that we use for preventing this kind of thing. So one, so in the biological regime, one is just max, mass, vaccina mass vaccination. We just give everybody the flu vaccine. Um, and this works. I mean, obviously it works, but it's immensely inefficient. Uh, you have to give virtually everybody the flu vaccine in order to prevent the flu from spreading. spreading. Uh, an alternative um, uh, that's been recently suggested is a more targeted vaccination strategy where you only vaccinate the people who are at highest risk for an infection. And if you do that, it turns out that's enormously more effective. Instead of having to vaccinate 90% of the population, you only have to vaccinate 10% of them or something like that. So it would be a lot less expensive and a lot more efficient. The only catch is that we don't know how to identify the people who are at highest risk. We have no way of finding out who those people are. If you knew the entire structure of the network, perhaps you could do it, but normally we don't. So a third possibility is what we might call reactive prevention, where 
basically what you do is, when it looks like you're getting close to an outbreak, you tamp it down. You say, oh, I see something bad going on over there. Let's uh, go over there and vaccinate people. If you see something bad going on over here, you go over there and you vaccinate people. So an example of this would be the ring vaccination strategy that was an important part of the elimination of smallpox. That every time you see an outbreak, you go and treat people over there to prevent it spreading. So there has been work on that kind of thing as well. And it does work, but there is a catch. So this plot here shows, as the transmission probability increases, there's your traditional epidemic threshold where an epidemic disease breaks out. Here's what happens if you do this sort of reactive prevention. You do much better. The transmission probability can go much higher before the disease breaks out. But the catch is that when the disease does break out, it's much worse. There's this huge jump to suddenly lots of people infected. The analogy I like to give here is to uh, forest fires. Uh, they, they, in forest fires, they practice fire suppression where you uh, put out any little fire that starts. And this prevents fires from happening, but it has the negative effect that uh, dry wood tends to build up in the forest. There's a lot of brush in the understory of the forest that's building up over the years because there haven't been any fires to burn it out. And then when a fire does happen, it's particularly bad. There's all this dry fuel there, and you get a very bad fire. Um, so this is kind of an analogous thing that you're, you can prevent these things from happening, but it's not necessarily a good thing to do because uh, the net result is that when something bad does happen, it's especially bad. OK, I'm out of time here, so I should stop talking. Hope you, I've given you some food for thought here. We'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, well, uh, they're setting up the slides. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the disclaimer, um, save us a little bit of time. So what I'm about to say uh, are uh, uh, my, my thoughts alone. I'm not speaking on behalf of the OFR or the US Treasury. Um, they don't let me do that. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, um, uh, I'm going to start by providing uh, a working definition of uh, FinTech, um, and then run through uh, a handful of examples uh, um, uh, to, uh, there, there are so many dimensions to, uh, to FinTech and financial stability, can't possibly cover them all. Uh, so I'm just going to hit a handful uh, of what I, I, I hope are illustrative examples um, and, uh, and, and catch some of the, the themes. Um, and I do need my slides. <laughs> it's okay. So, so I, I can um, start with uh, uh, my working definition of fintech. I actually don't have a slide for that. Uh, um, so uh, um, the way I've been thinking of it is that fintech is not simply uh, um, a combination of uh, finance plus technology, sort of two great tastes that taste great together. Um, uh, of course, we've had combinations of finance and technology for centuries. Uh, Dick mentioned the, uh, the telegraph uh, er earlier. Um, uh, actually, technology uh, um, literally uh, it goes back to uh, earliest recorded history as a, a key component of finance. So uh, um, uh, um, cuneiform writing was built out in large part to support bookkeeping in Sumerian granaries back in the day. Um, so uh, um, uh, fin FinTech is, is about the, uh, the or, or I'm sorry, financial technology is about the earliest thing uh, we know about. Uh, <clears throat> my definition of uh, FinTech is going to be a little bit different and try to capture the fact that uh, we didn't talk about FinTech uh, until very recently. This is uh, um, a, a new phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, in my definition, fintech is a financial service that is enabled by a computational technology. Um, and keyword there is enabled. So, uh, the notion is that the service would be uh, infeasible if you didn't have the computational technology. Um, so, for example, uh, counterexample, uh, um, ATM machines uh, give us the ability to withdraw cash on the weekend. Um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember life before the ATM. We could, in fact, withdraw cash from our bank accounts on the weekend. 
Uh, um, we did it by cashing a check at the grocery store or the convenience store. Um, th th there were mechanisms for this. Uh, um, uh, the, the sorts of things uh, that um, I'd like to count as, as FinTech are uh, approaches designed to address big data scalability problems in finance. So FinTech is our response to the big data revolution. Um, in other words, uh, you can't use linear technologies to solve exponential problems. Uh, FinTech is the exponential technologies that we use to address uh, the, um, the, the big data problems. And that's why you see, um, for example, uh, at London Club, a third of the headcount uh, is computer scientists, because you need uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, power. So uh, um, I knew that Mark was going to talk about uh, phase transitions. Um, so, uh, um, so, so I, I came up with uh, one of my favorite little pictures. This is a, a, a phase transition from financial markets. Um, <clears throat> It's also closely related to a financial stability question. Um, so uh, you, you'll see that something happened there about two-thirds of the way through the time series. Um, that something was the failure of Lehman Brothers in September 2008. Uh, and it also, um, uh, uh, the way I want to interpret it, coincides with uh, um, the beginning of the fintech revolution. Um, and. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. First of all, what are we looking at? Um, so the, uh, the, the blue line there is a market price. That is uh, the interest rate charged on federal funds. These are overnight interbank loans. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the money on these transactions settles in the reserve accounts of uh, member banks at the Federal Reserve. And a uh, key point to observe there is that because it's held at the Federal Reserve, uh, there is no chance that your, uh, um, uh, the, the bank holding your money overnight is going to fail. Okay? The, the alternative is that you might deposit it at another uh, commercial bank, um, and uh, th those banks could, in fact, fail. The, uh, all right, so the so blue line is the interest rate. The orange line uh, is the aggregate balance in, uh, in those reserve accounts over time. And you'll, you'll notice that uh, for a long period, uh, the, the aggregate balance was uh, hugging close to zero. Um, and in fact, there are minimum reserve requirements, and the banks uh, would uh, keep their reserves as close to the minimum as they could. And, uh, and in fact, if you trace that back, uh, I look back as far as the uh, early 1950s, it never budges uh, over the, the, the flat line. It, it, it stays down there. Um, uh, and, and the reason is that the Federal Reserve doesn't pay interest. So if you've got money you can, uh, um, th th that you need to hold, you can uh, um, put it someplace at interest or uh, um, uh, hold it uh, essentially for safekeeping with no interest. Well, <clears throat> obviously something changed here, right? Um, the, uh, um, I, I think what, what happened was uh, um, uh, something similar to the complex contagion uh, story, uh, where all of a sudden uh, there was uh, large-scale distrust in the system as a whole. There was a flight to quality. Uh, um, and uh, even though you weren't earning interest, uh, you were willing to hold large sums of money uh, in your reserve account at the, at the Federal Reserve. Um, uh, an interesting question, uh, um, uh, given that uh, these balances have persisted at a uh, uh, significant level well after the crisis is whether we're in uh, a disequilibrium situation. So there's an argument uh, to be made uh, um, from sort of standard Keynesian models that uh, um, the, uh, the interest rate is constrained at the zero lower bound, the market coring price is negative, we can't get there, and, and therefore uh, um, uh, allocation of resources uh, is, is suboptimal. Um, or are we in some new, equi well, <coughs> excuse me, new equilibrium uh, um, uh, that, that we've just never seen before. Um, is, is this uh, um, a, a brave new world? Don't have the answer to that. I think it'd be an interesting thesis topic uh, um, for a student in the Ford School. Um, uh, but there it is. How does FinTech tie into all this? Well, <clears throat> one of the things uh, that, that brought us to uh, the crisis was, of course, uh, subprime lending. 
and uh, their, uh, the, the subprime pipeline was a, uh, um, an enormous, uh, many splendored thing. Uh, um, but uh, so, so there are a lot of uh, technologies that enabled it. I'll just mention two, um, uh, and uh, in uh, in honor of Jillian's uh, remarks about uh, acronyms, um, I'll, I'll give them an acronym form. First is MERS, uh, the Mor Mortgage Electronic Registration System. Uh, so when when loans go into securitization trusts, they have to hop through um, a, a number of different ownership stages. Uh, that was uh, operationally impractical to do at scale until the uh, mortgage industry uh, concocted MERS. Um, uh, MERS has uh, a lot of uh, interesting stories around it uh, I won't go into, but it, it was a technological shift that enabled uh, a large-scale securitization. The other is uh, um, algorithmic pricing for CDO tranches, um, so uh, a lot of complicated math. Uh, uh, went into into that uh, again. Um, uh, the large scale securitization, the, the distribution of uh, the credit risk would not have been possible uh, with without those pricing algorithms. Um, okay. Quickly. Um, uh, so, so we just had a panel on HFT, um, uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, a really interesting topic. Clearly, HFT is a, uh, um, an activity uh, that is uh, impossible without the technology. Um, uh, I can, uh, um, I remember pre-ATM. I also can remember one of my first jobs uh, after I got my undergraduate degree was in a foreign exchange trading room. Um, we still had... Uh, at least one person on the desk uh, who had uh, uh, come up uh, straight out of high school uh, onto the trading desk. And uh, uh, I was led to believe that that was uh, fairly commonplace. Why would you uh, um, put an 18-year-old on a trading desk and let uh, him or her make million dollar trades on a regular basis. Uh, why does this make sense? Um, it makes sense because the, uh, um, uh, the fastest computational engine we had uh, back at that time were 18 year old brains. Um, uh, so uh, FX trading is ultimately not that complicated. You just need to have good reaction times. Um, uh, what we're seeing now is an arms race, uh, effectively, uh, in, uh, in transaction uh, latency. Um, one thing about arms races is uh, uh, the, uh, the participants seem to want to keep racing um, long after everyone else uh, thinks they've, uh, think they've crossed the finish line. Uh, um, and uh, um, uh, there's a policy question in there about whether uh, um, uh, it, it makes sense to, to intervene in some way. A uh, couple of technical um, uh, issues that didn't come up, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uh, um, uh, looking to uh, some of the folks from the HFT panel to, to maybe inform me on this, but uh, um, regulatory timestamp resolutions uh, um, in, in these markets are orders of magnitude slower than uh, the transaction latencies. Um, and uh, what's uh, even uh, scarier um, to me is that we are, um, uh, we're not there yet, but uh, if trends continue, um, we keep getting faster, um, we will hit the, um, the physical limitations of our best uh, temporal measurement technologies, which is uh, common view satellites. Uh, um, and the uh, um, question I have is what does this uh, imply for uh, um, uh, policy and behavior around front running? And, and not front running in the sense uh, um, that, that John mentioned, uh, but uh, um, illegal front running where uh, you get a client order and uh, trade in front of it uh, because you know the client order is going to move the market. Uh, if we can't time stamp the trades, how can you possibly prove front running? Um, we, uh, um, uh, John and Michael both pointed out that there's a tendency for uh, um, the slow money to migrate to, to markets where they're less likely to be taken advantage of. Uh, um, 
is it possible and, and, and what would be the conditions uh, that would trigger a large scale withdrawal of participation from markets uh, if, if you knew um, that uh, 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 the system was rigged? I don't know the answer to that. I'll be, uh, um, uh, again, curi curious to hear what the experts have to say. Um, a, uh, um, uh, another question that uh, uh, strikes me in, in this context is the, the problem of tight coupling um, and uh, uh, whether the operationally um, uh, things will move too fast uh, um, uh, across markets uh, in ways that uh, uh, were unforeseen. Another uh, example is, is blockchain. Blockchain is not uh, um, a fintech by my definition. Um, so blockchain is not a financial service. It's a, a computational technology. But obviously blockchain is uh, an input to uh, a lot of uh, financial service uh, approaches. So it's worth considering. Uh, um, one thing that blockchain does uh, um, is to make clever use of uh, dependency um, to uh, to its benefit. So, so you know, typically in software architecture, dependencies are uh, um, a problem, not not a solution. Uh, but but blockchain turns the tables uh, and it uses. Uh, intertemporal dependencies, so the hashes uh, in the blockchain accumulate over time uh, with the effect that you get a lot of stability uh, in the, uh, uh, um, the recorded information. You can't uh, um, uh, um, disagree with the, the blockchain without disagreeing with the entire history of the blockchain. Um, the other uh, uh, thing that blockchain uh, does uh, closely related is it creates this cross-sectional dependency. There's a consensus formation mechanism. Uh, so participants in a particular blockchain have to buy into the chain, um, literally. Uh, and uh, that creates what I'm calling epistemic closure. Um, if, uh, um, if you don't know what that is, it's a, uh, um, it's a nice cocktail party phrase uh, for, uh, for groupthink. Um, uh, basically, each blockchain is a Truman Show, um, and you have to, uh, if you're going to participate in the chain, you have to agree to the consensus um, and agree to everything that's in the Truman Show. Uh, um, uh, I think that that has uh, lots of interesting uh, uh, economic and mechanism design implications that uh, we've only begun uh, to, to consider. You know, the, the Bitcoin blockchain um, uh, started this off, uh, and uh, we were uh, um, at it before we um, knew what we were doing, really. Um, now there are lots of blockchains and with, with, with uh, uh, a range of mechanisms for permissioned access and, 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 and other things. Uh, um, uh, but I, I don't think that all the implications have been uh, explored or uh, thought through. Um, so governance uh, around uh, blockchain and, and, and hard forking in particular uh, is uh, an interesting and important policy question. Um, another one that we haven't confronted yet uh, because the landscape is still relatively mature is if you've got multiple blockchains. So imagine two central banks in different uh, uh, jurisdictions um, that disagree on whether trade is settled or not. Um, how do you reconcile that? Whose blockchain is right? Um, don't know. Um, I don't think it's, it's been addressed. Um, and then lastly, uh, um, uh, this uh, is an example of a larger uh, uh, issue of information centralization in financial markets. So one of the things uh, that's uh, um, come out of the crisis uh, is uh, um, centralization of clearing. Um, so with that comes a centralization of information. Uh, um, the, the benefits uh, for margining and default management are pretty clear uh, in, in, in that centralization. The, uh, the side effects involving uh, information centralization um, 
I'm not sure have been uh, fully thought through. Um, I'll give uh, uh, one uh, particular example, um, uh, which is uh, the Equifax breach. So the Equifax business model uh, was created long before uh, there was an internet, um, and uh, the, the cybersecurity issues were essentially non-existent. Uh, but the internet did occur, and uh, um, uh, the, the digitization of uh, credit risk information occurred. Uh, and uh, what had been uh, an operationally uh, efficient business model uh, became a glorious honeypot uh, for uh, cyber thieves. Um, and uh, we, we, we need to take that into account. Um, and then lastly, one uh, example, um, I could probably talk for an hour about this picture. Um, I, 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 I will keep it very brief. Um, this is uh, um, an example of the uh, supervisory response. Um, so another thing that's, that's happened since the crisis is uh, um, we've started getting uh, um, fairly uh, elaborate network data that, that simply um, uh, did not exist in one place before. Uh, this, uh, these are network statistics calculated for um, uh, CDS obligations. So we have weekly snapshots of the US CDS market um, and we're able to construct uh, a network of uh, who's obligated to whom. Um, and then we're calculating for uh, those, each network snapshot, what is the complexity? Well, what does complexity mean? Um, we're looking at the complexity of uh, um, uh, unwinding or resolving the network if we had to. And the key thing we are looking for there are cycles. So if, if uh, an obligation comes back around through various participants to, uh, back to its starting point, um, we argue that that creates a, uh, a coordination problem. Um, and uh, so cycle rank complexity is one way of counting the cycles in the network. There are a lot of other ways. Uh, um, uh, that's what we're doing there. Um, you see uh, across the bottom uh, the, the sort of crashing waves of uh, cycle uh, rank complexity for individual vintages of a particular index CDS, a CDS contract. Uh, and then the blue and green lines across the top are the complexities of the market as a whole, uh, calculated two different ways. Um, and that is going through the London whale crisis. So uh, complexity is growing um, as the crisis builds. Um, and in the middle of the picture, uh, um, uh, JP Morgan starts to unwind things and complexity starts to drop again. And with that, um, I will. Thank you. So thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, so I tried to be like a lawyer today, and I have one slide, so perhaps that was not wise, because I'm going to miss my slides here in a second. But um, OK, I'm, I'm going to talk about four points. And actually, the one slide partially is so that, that I can, you can have these four points sink in. I'm going to talk about the lending side. Um, more than the trading side. Um, and the, the panel, there's just one, yeah. And you know what, that makes you our favorite. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the panel's supposed to be about systemic risk, and so I'm gonna talk about areas uh, where our consumer facing um, the loans and the credit markets and so forth, where we should think about the future and where the capital is coming from it and, and these sort of issues. So the first one, which um, when we were organizing this, our organizer said, well, that's not, you need to tie that tighter to systemic risk. So here we go, we're gonna try. Um, the idea here is there's some natural data monopolies. Okay, and so let me start with an example that's not here in the US. Um, in PESA and, and the telecoms in, in parts of Africa. Right, M-Pesa owns the mobile banking, everyone mobile banks in Kenya and a bunch of other places. The telecoms are the provider. Okay, these are natural monopolies, if you will, of data. Well, what does it mean for credit? Well, they're also the natural providers of credit because you can see all the transactions, you can better credit score, and they are the bank, essentially, right? So that's a natural credit provider. Okay, the, the governments in Africa, in different, to a different degree, force open, open, opening up of these mobile payment um, facilities to other providers, but it's a natural monopoly. 
Okay, so that we should be concerned about natural monopoly for a number of reasons, but um, in the case of thinking about systemic risk, it means where's the risk? Who's holding the capital? Who's providing the capital? That means there's a natural monopolization of the capital going into the credit markets and all these consumer-facing um, instruments in Africa, or oligopoly, if you will, with the different telecoms. Um, so um, I gave a, a keynote on fintech in Kenya to a bunch of governments, and they're like, what? No, yeah, I mean, the, and, and I think, though, if we t bring that home here, or this may not be home, but it, we bring it here, what is the parallel? Well, there's lots of parallels, parallels we haven't thought about. Um, it's about data. It's about information. So I can better credit score you, any of you, based on your observables, income and FICO score, if I had your Facebook page. Why? Well, your Facebook friends are predictive of your risk, things I can't see, right? That's a natural monopoly. Why? Because Facebook is a natural monopoly. PayPal, again, payment streams, Amazon, I can keep going, right? These are natural monopolies over information. There's a, a paper, um, this Jorgensen has a paper on how you can credit score people based on consumption items they buy, right? And so these things, this is, this is the future. You know, all these things are collapsing. And if you don't believe me, we need to go to our leader country, which right now is China. Right? China is way ahead. Alibaba is way ahead. Right? They own payments, consumption, and credit. And they can do a better job of scoring everybody. Okay, so now I'm supposed to talk about systemic risk. Well, systemic risk is where's the capital? Who's holding the risk of these natural monopolies? What's the risk of the data? There's lots of things that are systemic here when you have natural monopolies over information. Okay, so that, that's point number one. Um, point number two, which is related, the capital for, for platforms. So as we heard from the Lending Club earlier, the peer-to-peer you know, -peer model, the word peer, the second peer in that is not really peer anymore. It's peer to hedge fund or peer to banks, right? The investors in peer-to-peer -peer are institutional, largely, not all, not, no, not all but, but you know, this is one of the of three sources or one, three uh, models of, plat of where the money comes from for the, con the consumer-facing platforms on lending. Um, and it's the original one, and it's the one that appealed in the disruption, particularly coming out of the crisis, even though these existed before the crisis. Um, so the idea there in the peer-to-peer -peer original is that the, the money is diffuse. Well, the reality is the money is not diffuse that's coming in to fund these platforms. Um, and so the three models are, are um, here. I don't know if I, yeah, I wrote them up there. Um, and a lot of the models, most, most firms are some sort of hybrid of these three. So the, there's the peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and but I should mention on the peer-to-peer, -peer, by the way, the, the default risk and the, the platform risk is different for retail clients than it is for institutional clients. The, my regulator here that's going to come after me. It's an interesting fact. I didn't, I didn't realize that the, the exposure of a retail investor to Lending Club is different than the exposure of an institutional client to Lending Club, which is an interesting artifact that the SEC tells me. The second, thing, the second one um, is what I call a platform pooler or an, an, S, an ABS pooler, um, where the platform takes loans and pools them into a, an, an asset-backed security. And then, and then those go off to institutional investors, so eliminating one, one financial intermediation in, in pooling them themselves. And here we, again, who holds this capital, right? Who who's holds this risk? Who's providing the capital and holding the risk? And I don't think we have any idea. Lending Club may have an idea in terms of their risk, and each of the, the platforms will, will have an idea, but I don't think we know who's, who's got this risk in the economy. Um, certainly the big investment bank type entities, which we don't have investment banks anymore, but these entities are, are pr big participants in this market. Um, and, but where, you know, where, where is this risk sitting? I don't think we have a good idea. So that's, uh, that is um, the second type. The third type, um, which 
many of the platforms have moved further this way, self-liquidity funding, I don't know what I called it, yes. Um, and the idea here is that the platforms get either loan facilities for a potential ABS, or they get loan facilities that they are on their own, that are on their own balance sheets. So again, where's the risk, right? Is, is it sitting on the balance sheet of some of these platforms? Is it Goldman Sachs holding a lot of this? We, I don't think we have any idea, or at least I don't. Maybe some of the regulators hopefully might know, but I don't think we have any idea. Now, these, these, the, the volumes thus far have been you know, small relative to thinking about the total 13 trillion in, in consumer finance float, um, but they're getting bigger. And certainly Rocket Mortgage is an enormous um, entity, but of course that has their own mortgage, mortgage side. But I think we need to get ahead um, in understanding this risk, where this risk is, to think about, you know, what, who, what is the regulatory frame? Is there one? Is there need to be one? You know, and so here is a, um, something worth thinking about. Okay, number, number three. Number three um, is about web bank, essentially. Um, the, the banks that, that do the, the funding, for the, the, the banking process for the platforms tend to be these industrial banks like web bank. I, this is the, the weakest of my knowledge sets here, but, but these banks have what's, I believe, called a light touch regulatory framework. And so they're banks, but not regulated as much as some other banks. I mean, I, I, I don't know those details, but I wanted to bring up another issue um, that, that, that came up earlier as well. Um, so we've, we've transferred Think about what these, these banks are doing. One thing they're doing is you import the, the state banking regulation of web bank or the industrial bank to the platform. So we, Lending Club, for example, the regulatory framework for the banking, and that's the usury laws and things like that come from Utah. Okay? And that's fine. Um, you know, the credit card companies have long done this. It's not like this is new. The, the difference, though, I, I do think we need to think about that in context of moving the, the part of consumer debt from credit card revolving float to installment. And the reason I'm bringing that up is, you know, as we talked about that Discover is, and that was interesting, that Discover is now a platform doing installment loans. Well, Lending Club maybe should be a platform doing Discover as well, and you may owe me millions later for having said that. <laughs> but the, the, when we hit a downturn, you've taken a customer that had $16,000 paying higher interest rate on a Discover card or something else, on a credit card, and you've moved them into an installment product, to, and they get out of debt quicker. However, if they don't have money for the payment, the payment is much larger than it would have been on the, the credit card. So that, does that become systemic in terms of this because we have a framework that is um, largely installment based and largely based on a, a, you know, a state banking regulation that's perhaps one of the more flexible in terms of the rates and things like that. So bringing these together, I think there is a systemic, as we see more and more consumer debt moving into installment, which again, I like the benefits of that, getting people out of debt quicker. Um, but it comes with some cost in a downturn. And I don't think anyone has talked about that at all, and I think it's worth talking about. Now, the final one I could talk about, which I don't even know if you can see, I could talk about for an hour, uh, discrimination and, and democratization. So I gave a paper here yesterday at Michigan in the finance group on discrimination and whether the, the algorithmics, um, credit scoring, uh, does better or worse in terms of discrimination than having loan officer touch where you can see faces, essentially, right? Okay, algorithms, you can't see faces. Okay, on the other hand, um, algorithms, you add more data. And adding more data, you may be putting in discriminatory data. And so then the question becomes, well, what do you mean discriminatory data? And we get into this, this legal term of disparate impact, which has already come up once today. 
And so um, some co-authors I, and I, including a, a lawyer from Berkeley Law, um, have written a paper and we try to connect the idea that economists talk about of statistical discrimination to, um, to the idea of disparate impact and what the courts are struggling with. And I think it's really very important because I don't, we, the courts don't have a framework now for, for as we move into big data, what it means, what is disparate, how, how could you possibly test for disparate in, impact? The, the current court um, terminology is that a lender can, um, if, if, if there's discrimination in the raw statistics, a limit, lender can say, no, no, we're using variables that are legitimate business necessity. That's the term in the court. Well, legitimate business necessity, actually the economists have something to say what that means. I can write down a, a model from life cycle model of, of repayment risk that comes out of your you know, understanding income and wealth, your expense levels in your area where you are. You just write down an economic model of repayment risk for a person. And variables in that repayment, in that model, are legitimate scoring variables. Variables outside that model are illegitimate. However, we can't see all the variables inside that, that model that I want to write down. For example, family wealth. You can imagine some minority groups have different family wealth structures than, uh, than um, some, some of the majority groups. And so how, how are we going to, going forward, give, as we move more and more into big data and algorithms to credit scoring, how are we going to move, how are we going to regulate the idea of letting Lending Club and others do a better job of sorting people because we can lower the interest rate on average for everyone if we do a better job of sorting. Uh, it doesn't work out best for everyone, but it, it, on average it, it does. And so the idea in what we've, we've mapped in doing this study is that um, if a variable, the correlation of a variable with the hidden variable that you can't see, if if race or ethnicity or gender comes into that, that correlation um, only through the hidden correlation with wealth, say, that should be legitimate statistical discrimination. The extent that you're over adjusting race beyond the hidden wealth variable or whatever you're trying to proxy for, that should be illegitimate statistical discrimination under disparate impact um, discussions. Or, illegitimate business necessity, because it's not a business necessity if it's not in the fundamental risk uh, model. So we think we're, we're going to push knowledge on that. And by the way, the study finds that the fintechs are doing better than the, the um, lenders now, and this is in the mortgage market, than the, the, the traditional lenders, more, more so on the smaller traditional lender side, because um, it must be because of a, a lack of uh, facial recognition. So we still are having that loan officer in group bias whether they know it or not. Um, but I think the future we need to think more deeply. So finally, I'm, I know I'm out of town. I, I'm, I'm going to say something about democratization and inclusion. Um, the, the, you know, the idea, and it, it came up in, our, in the, the, the nice comments from Richard from the Lending Club about inclusion. So the lending platforms are not being more inclusive of people at this moment, in, in, at least in the United States. So in other words, I don't think Lending Club would say, we're reaching out and getting to more Americans on the consumer side. What they would say is we're reaching out with more inclusive products. Okay, those are two different things. We're not seeing that, that technology has yet democratized on the consumer side, and they may push back on the, the small business side. But on the consumer side, you know, the, the, the people that are going to the platform loans, the, the large ones, um, are, are taking credit card debt and getting lower interest rates and getting an installment product that they presumably prefer by revealed preference. Okay? So I'm not saying that's not good. That is good. That is that we have a more inclusive product offering that fits people better. That's what they want if they're moving that way. But it's not that we're reaching out and democratizing finance, right? We, we have not done that on the consumer side with these products as of yet, to my knowledge. And so as we, we talk 
more and more about fintech and inclusion, which is an important word, um, we need to understand you know, what is the geography, what is the geography in a bunch of different ways, demography of fintech and inclusion, and how, how can we you know, understand what are the hindrances and, and what are the thing, how to provide models that are inclusive with, again, proliferating the product offering, which I think appeals, you know, finding better fits for better people. So I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done on this particular point, and the fact that Lending Club is talking about it is a wonderful step, and we need to, to do more on the academic side to, um, to, get to, to get to these points. Oh, I, I was supposed to put it in terms of risk. I think I put there the, the political risk, right? The, the, and which is true, right? We've seen it in the elections. People are angry of you know, feeling, we had this conversation left out, last night, left out or whatever, lack of opportunity or however you want to think about the anger in, in the population. Um, I think uh, inclusion is a really important topic. Anyway, I'm out of time, thanks. Well, thank you very much for having me here uh, today. I'm Jared Sawyer, I serve as Deputy Assistant Secretary for financial institutions policy at the U.S. Treasury. And I promise to keep my remarks uh, pretty brief so you guys can ask questions and we can have a, a moderated panel because I know there's a lot of fascinating uh, research that's been presented here today. But what I thought I would kind of do is provide a little bit of an overview of what Treasury has been doing in the financial regulatory space uh, since the Secretary uh, assumed office and how we think about financial regulation and how that trickles into a discussion on, on financial technology. So a lot of our work can be traced back to an executive order uh, that was issued by the President in February that you'll hear me refer to as called the core principles executive order. And really what the core principles executive order did was it outlined certain core principles that the president uh, had, in, had in mind and how he wanted the financial regulatory uh, framework uh, to look like and to match up with certain kind of core beliefs. And those core principles focused on issues like consumers having informed choices, uh, being able to save for retirement, making sure that American companies could be competitive internationally, making sure that we have effective and efficient regulation and that American taxpayers are protected from any kind of systemic risks. And so that core principles executive order certainly outlined the vision for a financial regulatory framework uh, under this administration but it also directed the secretary to study the current regulatory framework and evaluate whether the current framework was consistent with those core principles. And the mandate to us was if we found gaps or we found a misalignment of, of principles, we were to make certain recommendations. And so starting in February, the staff undertook a very rigorous stakeholder engagement process meeting with lawyers, market participants, consumer groups, think tanks, uh, other researchers to understand the current regulatory framework. And what we decided to do, instead of issuing a, a, a single report, we said, okay, let's take a step back and let's be very comprehensive in our study. And so we decided to break the report up into four separate reports so we could be comprehensive. And it focused on certain key subsectors of the financial sector. So the first report came out in June, and it focused on banks and credit unions. And really what that report did was it looked at regulations focused on capital and liquidity and stress testing of financial firms, kind of the, some of the core tenets of uh, the Dodd-Frank Act and many of the, the rules that we saw uh, that came out of international standard setting bodies post-crisis. It also looked uh, to a certain extent at some of our consumer financial services regulations. And we made a number of regulations where we thought that the regulatory framework could be realigned with those core principles. Um, and so we, we focus on regulations that can allow community banks to be a little bit more nimble um, and to hopefully slow the, the concentration uh, that we're seeing uh, in many of our rural areas in the, in the banking sector. Making sure that regulations are appropriately, appropri appropriately calibrated. Um, so in many cases, not calling for a full repeal uh, of a regulation, but saying, okay, 
let's make sure that the regulations are tailored and appropriately calibrated to consider the, the size of the institution, the, the products and services they're offering, and their risk profile. The second report that came out in October was focused on our capital markets. So it's how does the regulatory framework impact the flow of capital in our market functions? And so that focused on market structure, the availability uh, of companies to go, go public and reducing that burden. It focused on issues about uh, clearing of derivatives and central counterparties and small business capital formation. Um, so some really key topics when you think about the United States having the mo most robust and dynamic capital markets in the world. The third report that's been issued and the, the third and last one that's been issued as of today focused on the asset management and insurance industries. And both of those were in a single report. And so in that report, we focused on issues like what is the appropriate uh, evaluation and methodology for measuring systemic risk in those two subsectors. It focused on how should the United States engage in international standard setting bodies because many of the regulations affecting asset managers and insurance companies have originated in international forums. It certainly focused on issues about effective regulation and efficient regulation. So it looked at, you know, how can uh, electronic funds transfers, ETFs, uh, uh, how can uh, the approval process be streamlined through um, new SEC regulations? So those are some of the core, um, uh, core functions and work streams that Treasury has undertaken since the Secretary assumed office and that executive order was issued. The fourth report, um, which I probably is of most interest to this audience, will focus on non-banks, but also financial technology, fintech, and innovation. And we will probably spend a lot of time uh, focusing on, on those two uh, last two issues. Um, before I kind of dive into what you might expect in that last report, I think it's really critical to kind of take a step back and say, okay, if that last report um, averages the same length as the first three, we're looking at a roughly 800 to 900 page analysis of the US financial regulatory framework with hundreds of recommendations. And I think it's a, it's a very thoughtful analysis and study and one that I hope will ensure that the United States has a, a regulatory framework that is appropriately calibrated and promotes uh, financial stability, innovation, and competitiveness uh, for U.S. firms and allows certain market access for foreign firms. So focusing on financial technology, obviously um, financial technology is a, is a loaded word as, as we heard and it's very hard to define. You can think of uh, reg tech or regulatory technology. You can think of consumer facing technology you can think of kind of core processes of financial services firms. And those are all issues that we hope to cover in that fourth report. We're in the process right now of scoping out the work we wanna do and some of the core key questions we wanna ask ourselves. But heading into this report, especially this report, um, we're taking a posture of we really need to learn and be thoughtful in what we do in this, this next report. This report will be a forward forward-leaning, forward-thinking report in, in, in that it hopefully will set out our vision of a regulatory framework that promotes innovation uh, and allows kind of a robust and dynamic uh, financial technology marketplace to develop while still having consumer protections and system protections. And so, you know, some of the questions and key questions we may ask ourselves is how would a given development fundamentally, fundamentally alter a market structure or financial institution? How does the relationship of financial technology and incumbent financial institutions change the regulatory relationship? And how does a given fintech uh, firm impact the infrastructure of an incumbent financial services provider? So those are some of the key questions we'll be asking ourselves in this report. Um, kind of taking a step back uh, and thinking of, okay, so what is, what is Treasury's role other than kind of studying these, these, uh, these regulatory frameworks? Well, the panel discussion is on systemic risk. 
and the Treasury Secretary chairs the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, which is charged with evaluating and monitoring financial stability of the United States. So we always look at new developments through a lens of that role and his leadership of that council. We need to evaluate and appropriately evaluate financial stability and systemic risk. So that's always a lens that we, that we focus on uh, when we're evaluating regulations or new frameworks. And then also we have an incredibly important role and one I, I hope we'll touch on uh, today in cybersecurity. Treasury serves as the sector specific coordinator for the financial sector when it comes to cybersecurity. So we're not a regulator. But what Treasury does is it sits in a coordinating role across all of our federal regulatory agencies and tries to coordinate uh, responses, monitoring, uh, recovery, and prevention of any cyber attacks that might occur. What we've certainly seen over the, the last uh, couple of decades, but particularly this last decade, is an increasing reliance on technology by financial services firms which has really promoted a very strong financial sector. But it also results in increased complex and layered cyber risk because you have such a reliance on financial technology in these firms. And so what we really try to do and the posture we take at Treasury is there needs to be a public-private relationship in addressing cybersecurity. And so we spend a lot of time working uh, in a, with the private sector in, from a resilient standpoint, going through exercises to, um, to figure out how you might respond if a cyber event were to occur. We push the sector to think about, as you're, as you're building and implementing new technologies and new processes, are you thinking through the cyber risks? And how do those, all those different technologies interplay with your legacy systems? And so these are all kind of key questions that we think about, and that's just another lens that we use when we think about financial technology. So with that, uh, thank you for having me here today and look forward to having a panel discussion. So uh, Brian Knight, Mercatus Center. Uh, I was just curious whether or not you thought, and I guess this question is sort of a, on first impression for, for Adair and then the, the rest of the panel if they're interested. Uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve Governor Bullard talked about the risk that fintech might pose to banks by slicing off all the high value services, leaving banks as basically just dumb pipes and, and making them more brittle. D do you view that as a potential systemic risk uh, to the system? And if so, it would seem perverse to me that the answer would be, well, then we can't let the banks become brittle. Like, don't we need some method of unhitching the system from the fate of banks? I don't think the banks are going to let themselves become brittle. The, I, don't listen to me. In 10 years, I, I don't think we're going to see much distinction between any of these financial institutions, right? The banks will look like fintechs, the fintech name, I mean, it, it's all collapsing in my view, whether it's collapsing via relationships that we already have. The fintechs are providing CRA coverage for the banks already in terms of getting loans to the small businesses and, and, and people in CRA districts. The, the relationship with, um, you know, the, the Discover going from being a credit card to a lending platform, Capital One is a bank, right? I mean, it, it's, I'm not worried. It's, I think it's going to take care of itself. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that one, too. I, I think a couple things that distinguish uh, banks from the, the fintechs we're seeing. One is the level of capitalization. So banks are uh, um, uh, typically much more significantly capitalized um, and, uh, and, and also more heavily regulated. So a lot of the fintech uh, um, uh, startups are, are, are regulatory, regulatory arbitrage plays. Um, and uh, um, I would expect uh, the, uh, the, the force of capital to, um, uh, especially um, uh, when they go through the first downturn, right? So, so uh, um, uh, if you think about what happened to subprime loans, um, it was a great game until they, uh, they saw the, uh, 
the first downturn. Um, the, uh, the, the fintech ecosystem has not been through its first downturn yet. Uh, um, uh, I, I would expect to see a lot of consolidation um, in, in the vein that uh, Adair suggested. So, uh, I, thank you. I just want to sort of push back or follow up on that one point in the sense that to the extent it's a regulatory arbitrage play, there's also a significant difference in business model with the federally insured deposits. And so that, and I, I mean, I, I think your point is well taken that we are, everything that arises might converge. But on the other hand, to the extent that there is a need for a non something that happens outside the depository space, niches or whatever, then there may be, some, we may see some sort of independence there. By, but with, with contracts, right? We're in the law school, we have to talk about contracts, right? These things, you can form the relationships with contracts as, and still have the regulatory arbitrage you're talking about. Uh, as I listen to Jared's description of the uh, changes in the regulations, Obviously, um, uh, the existing financial reforms, uh, Dodd-Frank, not perfect, not necessarily well adapted to different kinds of institutions. But I, you know, having lived through the savings and loan crisis, which was a step toward deregulation, greater efficiency, greater competitiveness, leading to disaster. Uh, then we went through the derivatives deregulation, can't touch those, uh, that's the free market, it'll all work itself out, even bigger disaster. So I do have to confess I shudder a little when I hear, uh, hear you talk, and you're only talking in general terms, so uh, I can't be critical really, but I shudder a little when I hear you talking about more innovation in the financial sector because I'm not sure I mean, so much of that innovation has been at the direct cost of obvious or hidden systemic risk. No, certainly, that's, and, and that's, a, that's a fair point. I, I would say, you know, really the approach that we tried to take, and I think that you'll see uh, in looking at the three reports that are out so far, in, in many cases, it's a focus on tailoring regulation to the different uh, and myriad of financial institutions in types of financial institutions we have in the United States, and it's a recalibration of rules. It's not it's not wholesale repeal in many in many respects. It's saying you know what we've seen. This is a good moment in time, uh, you know, nine years post crisis to say what is working and what's not, and do we need to do we need to tweak the calibrations on some of these rules to make sure that market the market is completely efficient to the extent it can be completely efficient, right? Um, you know, I think one of the mantras that we take when looking at innovation as well is you also want to have responsible innovation. You don't want to have innovation that creates risk to the system or puts the consumer at harm. Uh, and so as we evaluate what is the appropriate regulatory framework for innovation, those are also principles that we will keep in mind. Can, if, I, if I can add a thought. Um, so in my response to the last question, I, I think as we, and the overlay, um, I think as we look forward, we need to start from the idea that the disintermediation took a layer out, at least in the sector that, that I was talking about, took a layer out of financial intermediation in the ABS market. So there's work by Thomas Philippon that each layer is 2%, right? So you have a 2% to work with. So there's 2% returns there that someone would, was either the consumer's paying on more interest or the investors are not getting as much to work with in terms of getting the structures right. So it's not that I'm, I think the innovation helps with efficiency, but I do think we have to get the regulation right. I'm not against regulation, you know, and, and, and it reflects the same as Jared, what Jared's saying. It's just we should see the benefits of the innovation and embrace those. At the same time, we're looking at what are the implications, some of the pictures that we saw first thing this morning. And so we need to think about the implications, but that doesn't mean that we need to say, wait, stop, because this, we have some benefits just in terms of removing one layer of financial services, which is worth 2%. And so I think that is a benefit to the people I care about, the households, right? And, and understanding what that benefit is and how to control other risk is really very important. 
my question is for the last speaker who discussed about uh, core principles executive order. Uh, how did you decide that you will be talking about liquidity and Dodd-Frank Act in the first report that was published in June? Why did you decide that those were the first priorities? So I guess the question is, why, did, why was the first report on banks and credit unions? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, that's, that's where we started. Um, you know, I think when you look at the United States and you look at the number of financial institutions, particularly banks and credit unions, you're talking about several thousands. They're in every single community uh, across the country and they're, they're core to the American financial sector and uh, financial sector and way of life, delivering products to, you know, citizens in urban environments, but also in many rural uh, environments as well. And so, you know, it, it just seemed like a, a good place to start. Um, and, you know, we followed from there uh, how regulations, you know, at, at entities, uh, banks, credit unions, um, can also impact the markets. And that's why I think it was a, a natural flow to the capital markets report. And was there any follow-up uh, from your recommendations from wherever you recommended that? Yeah, so certainly, you know, we don't want the reports to, to be the end game. Uh, you know, right now we have, um, I forget what the total number is, but, you know, a couple hundred recommendations across all those reports. And what we're hoping is we'll see a number of them uh, implemented and that they will match up with our independent agencies' priorities as, as they move forward uh, with their regulatory agenda. There's certainly some action Congress can take, and there's been some news and developments uh, up on Capitol Hill on some policy uh, objectives and changes that they're considering. And so, you know, this is really kind of a, a comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive way forward, um, you know, regulatory changes and congressional. Okay. Thank you. vis-a-vis -vis mobile wallets, Venmo, pick your non-bank provider, and I do realize how those monies and where they sit, they are not protected under FDIC insurance. Depending, it, it is somewhat qualified depending upon how they've set up those accounts. Why are we not contemplating, as we think about a non-bank charter, to actually structure this so that those consumers' monies have the similar protections that our bank accounts have? And how do we think about global systemic risk if we don't have that in place and we do have these monies flowing? Sure. So I'll, I'll comment just briefly. I think that's that's a, a fair question. Um, you know, I think what we what we're going to try and do uh, to the best of our ability in this last report is to really be comprehensive in the questions that we ask. And I think that's a it's a fair question and one you know certainly want to engage with with different stakeholders on that point to better understand you know what are the pros and cons. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and, and say the same thing. Excellent question. Um, uh, the uh, um, uh, e equality of treatment is, uh, um, uh, under the regulation is important, uh, but also uh, um, for uh, small investors, uh, um, the um, protection um, uh, uh, is, uh, has clearly been um, a, uh, uh, a regulatory priority for a long time. Uh, again, uh, we don't know what the loss experience is going to look like uh, in, until it's too late, uh, um, but it's something that uh, um, we should be thinking about.
So uh, if I uh, heard the question correctly, I'm not sure I did. Um, uh, we, we understand the network structure in banking fairly well. Uh, um, what do we understand about the network structure of fintech and what are the implications for risk? Um, I would say at this point, um, we don't have uh, a very good picture of the network structure for, for fintech. Uh, um, uh, I uh, um, uh, look at the, uh, the, the conference offerings uh, for fintech conferences uh, fairly frequently and the number of providers and sponsors that show up uh, on those conferences is, uh, is astounding to me. This is a very fervent uh, um, uh, ecosystem. Uh, um, it, it, there's a lot going on. Um, people are trying a lot of different things. Uh, um, exciting place to be. Uh, we don't have uh, um, uh, good central data collection on all the things, the things that are going on there. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a very interesting space. So, uh, maybe one more question. Hi. Um, what's, what's the Treasury's uh, position on regulating robo-advisors, especially in the context of DOL fiduciary rule, and whether or not you think that there's some uh, risk imposed by, opposed by um, robo-advisors going forward? Sure. So, robo-advisors, uh, and that issue in particular, what is the appropriate regulatory touch um, is something that we're going to be studying in our fourth report. I don't want to prejudge exactly you know, where we'll end up, um, but we certainly are very familiar with the issues that have been raised. Um, That's about all I can say at this point. So we, we're right at uh, 3.30. Um, uh, please join me in thanking the panel. Here we're going to take a 15 minute break and then we'll reconvene for the keynote um, from Federal Reserve Governor Lael Brainerd. Oh, you know, it's so easy to understand how these networks 